Hello and welcome everybody to the Analytics Think Tank Roundtable. This is Dr. Beverly Wright. I'm your host for this roundtable event that is sponsored by both Access Group and University of South Carolina Center for Applied Business Analytics. Hooray when my worlds collide. Um, <laughs> this, this particular roundtable focuses on a topic that um, is very near and dear to many of us as we're all trying to sort of find the right complexity and the right solutions and the right types and just increase our capabilities in the analytics and data science arena. As our problems become more complex and we're faced with challenges that we uh, need to have a wider tool belt, this evolution moving from a business intelligence mindset to more of a artificial intelligence mindset and eventually to a continuous intelligence uh, sort of mode is something that we're all striving for within the field. So it's for this reason that we've assembled this all-star panel of um, participants to help bring this content to you. So we're very excited about our panelists. So let me go ahead and share screen. Um, some quick introductions. I'm Beverly Wright. I'm Chief Analytics Strategist at Access Group. Um, I'm also the Director for the Center for Applied Business Analytics at University of South Carolina and a clinical professor. And I'm so excited to see my colleagues on, uh, on the phone with me today from both of these great institutions. We're uh, gonna have a great lineup for you within the next about 75 to 90 minutes. Scott Reedy from Access Group is gonna talk to us about the importance of this subject. Um, I'll explain a little more about the terminology to just sort of level set us and set the stage before we have our awesome panel talk to us in more detail about um, this journey from BI to AI and CI. And then we're gonna do something that is really fun and a little bit unique, which is our breakout sessions. Do not be intimidated. I will explain in just a hot moment. And then we will regroup for some call outs before making some final closing remarks. One thing uh, about the analytics think tank roundtables that is a little bit different from some of the other events you may have attended in analytics and data science is that um, to be frank, I got a little irritated a few years back, maybe it was six years, I think, that I've been doing these, that there's all this great stuff happening in our field and people were going and hear a talk and they walk away with nothing. But it didn't necessarily sink in. They're not anxious to go use it tomorrow. They don't, they didn't really get the whole point of it. So I created these roundtable events as a way of truly immersing yourself in the content. Um, and so the, the goals are more around deep, deeply, not deep learning, because that's a thing, <laughs> but more deeply learning the content as, uh, as well as networking. So you're gonna be able to meet people, even though this is a virtual environment, you're gonna be able to meet people in ways that you typically don't get in a virtual conference, for example. The breakout sessions, uh, the way they work in the original conceptualization was with these round tables where we actually had round tables in a giant room at a school, originally Georgia Tech and then Georgia State and then Emory and, and so forth. And so the, the round table idea is transferred virtually into these breakout rooms. In the breakout room, there will be a discussion leader and even if you have zero experience with analytics and data science, you can uh, fairly easily participate in one of those discussion topics. So the discussion leader will give you a few follow-up questions after the panelists talk, which you will get then discuss, hence the name. They'll take a few notes. And then when we regroup as a big group, we'll, we'll learn what you guys said, as well as some of the other groups. So that's the way our roundtables work with the goal of networking, learning, elevating thought leadership, highlighting data science and its importance in our community, as well as collaboration and stimulating innovation. For those of you who are not familiar with um, some of these terms, we're throwing out like alphabet soup over here. We've got um, this term, 
business intelligence, which we will often refer to as BI. And business intelligence is, um, if you will, the descriptive side of the analytics maturity curve, if you're familiar with that, but it's more descriptive and hindsight. So this is where you might uh, sort of look in the rearview mirror and say, what did we do in sales last month? Or how did we you know, perform on satisfaction with our customers last year compared to the year before? And this is very useful for many problems, believe me. It's um, an incredible tool. So that's business intelligence is to be able to do that preferably in an agile environment, preferably with a dashboard, preferably a little bit customized, those sorts of things. But the nature, the gist of it is that it's, it's um, descriptive in a sense and it's hindsight, okay? Or yeah, it's more hindsight. AI or artificial intelligence is, uh, is a lot of things, <laughs> but in our context, it's emulating the human processes to create analytic solutions and data science in a more automated fashion. So for example, a human might iterate on models to come up with one that is more optimal, or a human might automate models within different systems. And so the AI is a way of uh, allowing machines to learn from themselves and through pattern recognition, which will advance some of the complexity of your data uh, insights. So this goes from um, looking backwards and seeing what was into more of looking forward and being able to see what can be or what is about to happen or what we should do. And so it gets into, if you're thinking about the Gartner analytics maturity curve, it gets into more predictive and prescriptive types of solutions, okay? Not every problem necessarily needs AI, but the, um, the idea is that you wanna be able to do more AI if, if needed. And then the third one is continuous intelligence. And that's about this, uh, which is a term I'm less familiar with, but it, I believe it's used by Gartner. I'm not sure if it was originated by them, but the notion of continuous intelligence is constant learning. And this is uh, more of a, it's not a one stop and it's not a one time and we're there. It's more of a enabling the ability to constantly uh, learn. So those are the three main topics that we're gonna be talking about. So if we say BI, AI, and CI, that's what these three things mean. Um, thanks everyone. My name is Scott Reedy. I'm the VP of Data and Analytics Consulting at Axis. And as I was reflecting, uh, kind of preparing for this uh, event, I remembered this quote the future has arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And it's by William Gibson, he's a science fiction author and honestly, he's not a pundit in our uh, field of, of expertise. I had to go look it up so I could attribute the, the quote to him. But it seemed uh, particularly relevant for the conversation today about evolving from business intelligence towards AI and continuous intelligence because here we are, the future has arrived. We've got uh, full self-driving autonomous vehicles. At the same time, organizations are struggling to get a clear view out of the rear view mirror, right? We know that um, most of us are, are in organizations where we're using spreadsheets to see uh, yesterday's sales. At the same time, we're able to talk to our phone. Um, so I like I said, I thought it was, uh, particularly re relevant. When we're talking about BI to AI to CI, like Beverly described, really we're talking about going from descriptive hindsight to uh, predictive to prescriptive. How can we make something, how can we make something happen? And the best way to do that is with uh, in the moment insights that are going to inform better decisions. And just this past weekend, I had an experience where that, that kind of data uh, definitely made a difference in, in my decision making. Uh, we, there's a, was an art festival in, in Roswell where I live in Georgia. And it's been a year and a half or more since been able to go to a, an art festival. We really wanted to go, but we've been in this weather pattern in the last week or so. It's been really unpredictable with with rain popping up, it's not the, the type of rain where there's a storm coming, you know it's coming, it's gonna pass, and when it's over, you got clear skies, but it's popping up. And I think about you know, uh, BI, how, how would I uh, make a decision? 
I could look at yesterday's weather. I could look out my window. I could look at the average rainfall in June, in, in the month of June, uh, in, you know, in the past, all to try to make my own prediction. Or I could rely on the weather app on my phone, which is going to give me an hour by hour prediction of what the weather's going to be and pick a window that looks like I'm going to be the safest to go to this you know, outdoor arts festival. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, went to the went to the art festival, but the, the weather is un, unpredictable. Uh, even though you, you know, do your best to predict it, I forgot actually that the the weather app that I use, Weatherbug, has a feature where it alerts you when there's lightning in the area. So we're at the at the art festival and, and joining enjoying the uh, the arts. When I get a notice on my phone that there's lightning within a couple of miles of, uh, of where we are. So, so you know what, family, it's time to wrap things up and head back the car. And sure enough, even though the skies at the time I got the alert looked the same as they did five minutes before that, by the time we got to the car, you know, five minutes later, it was starting to rain. So uh, just a great example of how uh, or the right data at the right time leads to better informed decisions. So how do we prepare for... Uh, continuous intelligence. And I thought about uh, a framework that a lot of people are familiar with. If, if you're not, um, the framework's called Delta. If you Google Delta by itself, you might get the airline or the faucet make, uh, maker. But if you uh, Google Delta and uh, one of the uh, key uh, creators of it, Tom Davenport, then you'll, you'll get the right framework. And I was thinking about this framework in terms of, uh, of CI and some of the aspects of, of data, for example, CI is all about near real-time, real-time data. So um, you're going to need to focus on your, your data ops capabilities in order to prepare. Or from an enterprise perspective, think about uh, enterprise data literacy at Access. We, we help companies uh, form enterprise data literacy programs. From a leadership perspective, you, you need leadership support, of course, um, but what does it take to get that leadership support? And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, from, a, from a target standpoint, you need strategic targets, but where do those targets come from? Uh, you know, requires some creativity. Um, from a, I wanna leave you guys actually with, with two key thoughts. The um, first thought is around creativity. So how do we generate those, those targets? And cre creativity is something that we think about leadership, for example. Uh, we think of leaders often being visionaries. That, uh, and where does that uh, created creativity come from? It comes from inspiration. And inspiration comes you know, to different people in different ways. Artists have their, their muses that they look to. Uh, and we here are looking to each other as part of the, the, you know, we're gonna hear from a panel, we're gonna participate in a breakout, all in order to kind of inspire our creativity, which leads to in innovation. And the second component is, is trust. So we need to be able to trust the people, trust the data, trust the algorithms in, in order to improve towards CI. If I think about one of the barriers for accepting automated decision-making, it's being able to trust that algorithm or, or trust the data. And to be trustworthy, something needs to be quality, or have quality, have reliability, and have honorable intentions. And when I think about honorable intentions, I think about the uh, data ethics, and I think about the um, transparency that's going to be required for people to believe believe the analytics. So hopefully you can take those two kind of key thoughts of creativity and trust into the uh, into the panel and into the, the breakouts. Thank you, Scott. Very nice. Um, and again, Scott Reedy is partner with, is that your title, partner, access group? What is your king? Well, of one of, I'm one of the principals of the firm Principal. and my role is the VP of data and analytics consulting. Thank you. Yes. He's also one of my bosses. So Thank you, Scott Reedy. Okay, with that um, opening to highlight the importance and the notion of creativity and trust, I hope you've already started thinking about like ways that um, you see this work within your organization or stories that you've heard or ways that it could work within your organization. 
um, and this notion of creativity and trust to evolve from BI to AI and eventually to CI. Uh, so I'll um, give us a quick introduction of our panelists and uh, I'll let you guys each introduce yourselves because um, I probably would not do you justice. Uh, so Chris, we'll start with you, sir. Sure. Thanks. And, uh, and, and thanks everybody for, uh, for joining us today. It's a great, uh, it's a great honor to get invited to be a part of a panel of, of experts like this. Um, I feel every, every time I go into one of these, I feel, <laughs> feel a bit underclass compared to the, uh, compared to the other panelists, but I'm, uh, I'm very excited to be here. So my name is Chris Chisholm. Um, I've been with PayPal uh, a little over two and a half years now, and I run a team um, it called Live An Merchant Live Analytics uh, in our risk intelligence team. Uh, so we focus primarily on the merchant side of, of PayPal's ecosystem, um, and we do a, a lot of various kinds of uh, decision science, data science projects uh, supporting decision makers. Before joining PayPal, I did a little bit of uh, federal consulting in the DC area, and then I was a, a Marine officer for about 10 and a half years before that. So uh, happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. A Marine officer. Cool. I'm sure that, that you've learned a lot from that that has um, worked its way into many other aspects. Very cool. Sure did. Sean, Sean Anderson. Hey, guys. And to echo Chris's sentiment, you know, really excited to be here with such a, a, a high class group of uh, both moderators and participants uh, and being hosted uh, by the university and, and Beverly Wright. So thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Sean Anderson. I've been lucky enough to work in the data and analytics ecosystem for just roughly over the past 15 years. Had some exciting uh, 10 years in companies like Rackspace and Cloudera, um, kind of being at that forefront of big data and uh, data science, Apache Spark and machine learning. Um, and currently I am head of product marketing at StreamSets. At StreamSets, we're big believers in product-led growth. We're constantly dogfooding and looking at our own telemetry of our products and trying to make kind of point in time and predictive decisions on how we should do product innovation, develop features, and, and a lot of that type of stuff. Um, so really happy to be here today. Uh, as well, I host a podcast called Sources of Destinations, where we interview data engineers, uh, talk a lot about data science trends there as well. I host Tag Data Talk, so we'll compete. <laughs> Very nice. Rafael. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Rafael Becerril. I am an assistant professor of marketing at the Darla Moore School of Business, so I'm Beverly's uh, colleague down there. Uh, I should also add that this is a great idea to have this kind of events. is it, it, amazing. Uh, I hope we all walk away, walk away with something new, something useful we learn. And it looks like looking at the caliber of the participants, that's going to be the case. So uh, what I do at the university is I teach analytics. So my goal is to uh, produce the, uh, the talent that is so scarce in industry. Uh, I help students uh, to learn how to structure and successfully complete data projects. Uh, and to this end, I use mostly business cases and uh, projects with some real companies. We have done that in the past. We discuss many different aspects of projects, including technical problems, organizational, managerial. And through this process is that I have actually learned a lot uh, and interacting with the students, many of them who already have experience in industry uh, about the challenges in the adoption of data science, and that involves uh, not even uh, uh, artificial intelligence, but even analytics or even business intelligence. I look yep. forward to the discussion. Rafael is one of the, the few of the academics that I've worked with um, at University of South Carolina and, and beyond that really get the importance of integrating within the practitioner world and uh, as part of that, he does something that is very hard and that I hope all of y'all appreciate, which is um, experiential learning. So learning by doing uh, it takes a lot of work, but uh, that's important to him. So if you want to have conversations about talent with him or about uh, maybe guest speaking, uh, he works on the data science and analytics within a marketing context. Thank you, Rafael, again. Edwin. Hi guys, uh, my name is Edwin Zhao. Uh, I am the director of the digital operations team for Siemens Health and Ears. Um, it's a little bit of an interesting title, but basically what we do is that we, we try to solve problems with data. I think some iteration of my team has been around for 20 or 30 years, mainly because of the need to use data to derive some sort of decision-making process. 
I, I think in the most recent times, as we move, kind of uh, maybe what Raphael said, you know, not even necessarily completely into artificial intelligence, but just understanding kind of the full Gartner curve and, and moving the company towards a more digital future is kind of where my area is. So nice to meet Love you. It. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. We have um, an amazing set of questions that really dive us right in. And like I mentioned before, if you joined a little bit late, uh, BI is the acronym we use for business intelligence. AI is for artificial intelligence, which are kind of um, data solutioning using human-based, typically human-based types of processes. It, it relies on pattern recognition. Machine learning is the most common application of AI within analytics and data science. Um, and then the third is continuous intelligence. So those are the three terms that if, if you hear us say BI, AI, CI, that's what we're talking about. Okay, cool. And then just a quick shout out, um, and you guys don't have to show your camera yet or anything, but we have really, really experienced discussion leads on here that are uh, very excited about having these breakout sessions with you following the main uh, panel, which we're about to jump into right now, including uh, Brian, uh, Coley from Southern Company, Georgia Power. We've got representatives from Salonis. We've got representatives from Axis Group. I know I'm going to miss somebody here <laughs> and so forth. <laughs> but we've got about a dozen of the discussion leads on the call now ready to work with you to have some conversation uh, briefly after the panel. All right. So the first question that I have for you guys is, um, we, we talk about this movement uh, from business intelligence to artificial and eventually continuous. Why, why do we do this? Why does this even matter? Well, Beverly, I'm happy to start us out here and, and really interested to hear uh, everybody's thoughts on this topic. Um, I think, frankly, in competitive markets, this is a critical transformation that has to happen. Um, and I was thinking uh, yesterday about this topic, and I, I honestly can't think of markets that aren't competitive these days with digital transformation, just the proliferation. Um, so for some companies, you know, business intelligence, doing descriptive analytics, understanding what's happening uh, without a real urgency or need to act on that, uh, that data or, or those, those impacts. Um, you know, might be fine. But I think, you know, when I see when I observe uh, the adoption of AI across uh, a lot of different types of enterprise companies, there's not a whole lot of silos of, of companies that aren't trying to get a competitive edge. So if you look at oil and gas companies, they're trying to use data to drill better, become more optimized, have lower overhead. Uh, you look at healthcare companies and they're just constantly trying to outdo each other in terms of timelines, bringing products to market, things like pharmaceuticals. Um, so I think it's absolutely critical. Um, the last thing I would say is now is really the best time to think about making this jump from BI to AI. Compute is at the lowest um, it has ever been in terms of cost. Um, and so companies can very affordably either build out their own capabilities for things like machine learning or AI, um, or uh, they can leverage things like cloud services with very little overhead, uh, allowing data scientists to, to really just go, go fast, uh, right? So I think it's this convergence of low cost of compute. And the other thing is the abundance of data. So Banco and Brill, two very famous data scientists that wrote you know, a corpus of, of research. Um, and one of the things that they really coined is specifically for machine learning AI, they say it's not a better algorithm that produces a better result. It's the more data that you feed that. So we now have an abundance of data, which means that when we develop models, when we, when we implement machine learning, artificial intelligence, it means those machine learning models are actually more accurate, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think this is just really a critical time for companies to evaluate, you know, adopting these capabilities. Okay. It's not more complexity necessarily, it sounds like I'm hearing you say, but there, uh, it's more options and more data that may be uh, what's important. Interesting. Other perspectives about why bother with this? I mean, like I'm answering questions. I'm good. I've got some good data. I can use descriptives. Why? Why is yeah. this? Yeah. I mean, to, to Sean's point, right? About um, yeah, the the thing that we've that we've started to really see, and one of the areas that we've really started to lean in on is it, we we have a lot of human processes, right? Despite you know, despite PayPal being as big and and, and as tech savvy as as PayPal is, 
there's still a lot of humans involved, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of folks on the phone. There's a lot of customer service folks. There's a lot of and and that all that all leads to a customer experience, right? When you pick up the phone and you have to talk to somebody about your account or you've got to talk to somebody about a an email you got, that's a you know that's a a, a bad outcome that we that we don't necessarily want, right? So if we can write models that will take care of those behaviors, that will solve those solutions, um, you know, faster or uh, more repetitively than than what our humans might. It saves us time, right? It lets our humans focus on the complex issues, the stuff that they've that a human is better suited to, to work on, and it's mm-hmm. a better customer experience on the other side for you, right? You you maybe never have to get on the phone because you can go through a you can go through a menu and and you know, maybe solve something on your own in a self service center. So, uh, you know, to Sean's point, like we it, we're at a point now where we're uh, you know we have to decide the combination of what kinds of things do we want to model, right? What are the, what are the outcomes that we're trying to model for? Um, and then how can we pair those up with rules? So how can we set up the trigger events that are going to put the right behaviors in place or, uh, you know, restrict the right accounts or lift the right accounts at the right time. So that's really like, you know, for us with the, the volume of data that's available to PayPal, that's really our challenge is, you know, how do you pick the right features and engineer the right features and then match the right rules and the right actions to those features? Mm-hmm. It sounds like um, if I'm hearing you right, there are a set of problems and some of them were just unsolvable before, but now they're more, at least more easily solved yeah. if you're able to use, um, I keep wanting to call it more advanced, but they're just, they happen to be more complex. They're not necessarily right. more advanced, you know, or the it, right size or the right fit for every problem. Yeah. And it's, and it's taking problems that we were asking humans to solve traditionally, right. On the, over the phone or in person and, yep. and really just saying this is a repetitive task that all these humans were able to do. Let's give this to a, a model or give this to a, a set of rules and, and let the humans focus on the more complex things. Mm, okay. Any other thoughts about uh, why we even take this journey? Yeah, I think, um, for, for, for me and for the things that we've been working on thus far, a, a lot of it is actually helping humans make decisions uh, in, a, in a better way. So as an example, I'm working on a, a project where we're attempting to digitalize and use data to look at the entire marketing universe, identify white space, identify segmentation. Uh, a lot of the times in the past, this data has been collated by specific people in the organization. So you had like a handful of people who knew everything about this data and they were kind of the point people in order to um, come up with our next target segment as an example. This kind of new environment, and I think it was somewhat exacerbated by COVID. Um, we, we have to move faster. Uh, like everything is being scrutinized from our side. Um, we, we want we want to spend less time kind of uh, engaging and, and trying to dig through all of the, the details of the data and be able to uh, float recommendations up towards the top that, you know, target accounts or whatever, you know, we have here. Um, it, it's kind of like we, we, we have to get better at, at using the data and, and being able to, uh, ex- you know, again, like target or prioritize or what have you. Um, this has been really the challenge for us uh, on a marketing side. On a sales side, uh, it, it's kind of injecting the, the insights to what I'll call the business rhythm. <clears throat> so Gartner talks a lot about this too, is that how do you bring your insights uh, to the rhythm of the business and ensure that that data is being sent at the right time to the right people um, to help them make the decisions that they need to do on a regular big business cadence. So we're moving towards that area too. And I think that it's, it's early on, but it's, uh, it's an interesting journey. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Very cool. Any final thoughts before we move to our next uh, question about this journey and movement? I'd like to basically touch on a bit of what uh, Sean, Chris, and Edwin contributed. Uh, my thoughts are very similar aligned uh, to, to their thoughts. Uh, what stands out to me the most is in terms of the benefits of AI and CI is that, well, as Edwin said, decision making is the ultimate goal. And you want to improve that in two dimensions. First is quality and second is speed. In terms of quality, uh, you want to scale uh, your data processing so that you can have uh, a more comprehensive view of things. You want to consider more models instead of 
estimating, like, say, 10 models manually, uh, let the machine estimate 100 models, 1,000 models. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also help you remove statistical biases, like reduce the problems with overfitting, which normally lead to uh, suboptimal decisions, and also improve the robustness of your insights. So it, it's going to improve also the trust you get, uh, uh, you have on, on your results. That's in terms of quality. In terms of speed, uh, it's not only about processing data faster, uh, but you can also clean it faster, which is also a, a big uh, uh, bottleneck for many organizations to uh, uh, do your data wrangling automatically. And of course, uh, process the information in real time and act upon those, that information in real time. Like think of recommendation systems in online uh, retailing, right? That has, data has to be collected real time, processed real time, and, and you have to act on the, on the spot in the right moment of suggest, make the right recommendations, the, offer the right promotions on the, uh, on, on just on, in real time. So, so those are yep. the two major advantages I see. Okay, yeah, this idea of um, business moments and real-time offers and being able to uh, run your processes agile um, in an agile fashion and, and inject, uh, like call it qua a quote, I think that Edwin said, we need to get better at injecting insights into the business decision-making process. So very good points. Um, our next question, you know, this is all well and good. Okay, now we understand it's important, but what does this look like? For real, what does this look like within a company when someone is trying to move? Does it look like a piece of cake? They're just like walking along nice and calm and, and they're advancing or, or what are, if there are struggles, what are these struggles? Like what does it, if you were to look into a company and you say, man, I went to that company for like a week and I lived in that company and I can tell they're going through a BI to AI transition. How do you know? Yeah, for us, right from the, from the kind of big company perspective, it's, it's always priorities. I mean, depending on depending on which part of the business you talk to, and and who owns which data process, and who owns which data source, and who owns the modeling process, it's it's always about priorities. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a product that's launching, there's a new product that's launching, there's a new market that's launching. We need this model to support this. We need that model to support that. Like it's there's always competing priorities about which business case is uh, the most important for a given uh, a given model or or a, or a given initiative. So. For us, it's it's almost always about writing, uh, you know. At this point, right, it's it's about writing the best business case uh, mm. to sell why you need uh, it, what it is you need, right? So as as you move from describing the business, right, from business intelligence, where you're just kind of generally describing the likes of today's business, yeah, uh, to getting more predictive and more prescriptive, it's there's always there's always tools that need to get built, there's always models that need to get built, and it's about building that business case and, and wow. incrementally piecing together the, the business case. And then, you know, you find yourself a couple of years down the road and you turn around and look back and realize you've come a long way, but, but it is always uh, out there kind of competing against the priorities. Wow. Okay. So one way that you can tell for sure that a company is going through something like this is that they're trying to, um, I'm, I almost want to use the word fight, but maybe that's a little too strong, but they're trying to prioritize um, the most important initiatives to yeah. apply, you know, some sort of data science. Okay. Right. So it's right. this jockeying of sorts uh, right. and coming up even with a template or framework for right. identifying ways to prioritize these sorts of things. Okay. You find your business intelligence tools that you spend all that time building, getting used against you. There being somebody's building a better business case with your business intelligence tools. It's you've, you've arrived. Oh yeah. I hear you. <laughs> Never had that happen. <laughs> All right. What, what are some other ways that this manifests itself? Like you can tell they're going through this transition. I think for my side, it, it is um, adoption at, at a leadership level. So recently, I, I think on Siemens Health and Ears, we've, we've got a few leaders who are very data driven, who are really into looking at data and using it as uh, part of their decision making process. Um, Siemens is Alvin is a pretty old company uh, and we have a lot of um, call it legacy processes or legacy thinking on how to do things. And as we move more digital, you know, the requests that I get, the things that are higher up on my priority continues to change and it continues to become like my, my backlog is getting bigger. I keep getting more kind of data analytics requests, data science requests to try to move us uh, further along in the process. So I think the prioritization topic is, is a good one. That makes sense to me. 
you know, I, I keep seeing more and more things kind of, again, in my backlog that are around that area. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms and of why everybody wants to be your best friend all of a sudden, right? Yeah, everyone's, everyone's your best friend. Everyone, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little crazy for sure. Um, I mean, it, it is a journey. I think, you know, back to one of the questions that we have here is that, you know, how, how is it, how do we know and, and how is the journey kind of progressing? Um, Gartner's kind of analyst curve, I think, makes a lot of sense in general. So as you go, go through a maturity curve as a company, you can kind of see it if you step back a little bit and see how things are trending. Um, to me, if you use the Gartner curve as an example, uh, you start seeing it move from the second level to the third level. You start seeing more requests happening, more leaders engaged. Um, I think sometimes you just have to stop, kind of take a look and, and investigate and, and kind of see where you are. I mm-hmm. think a lot of times we get stuck kind of in the minutia of, of the daily grind, but um, thinking bigger picture, looking bigger picture, understanding the strategic goals of the company. These are big things for me. Yeah. Okay. So if I heard you correctly, um, and I may be reading between the lines a little bit here or misquoting, so let me know if I need to um, to correct any of this, but I've got things like adoption. You're starting to see that they're not just making golden gut decisions. They're adopting solutions um seeing your level engagement it's not just a director and below type of thing it's uh, conversations among the c-suite that is um centered around discovery and and insights Uh, you also mentioned more requests that's kind of a tactical signal but for sure that's a big signal and that's where everybody's trying to be your best friend and take you to lunch (laughs) uh the decision making process itself i think Again, this one I'm sort of reading between your lines, but I think you're saying the way you're illustrating is like there, people are making decisions differently and you can see it that maybe they're more deliberate. Maybe there's a process that includes um, keeping up with the data. And then the last one, uh, again, I'm sort of inferring this one is that it forces companies to rethink their strategies. So they're sort of having to swim upstream a bit and rethink like, what do we, what is it that we're, you know, why are we here? What are we doing? before we invest in all this analytics and data science. Does that make sense, Edwin, as far as a punch list of, of sort of what you said? Yeah, I think you're better at explaining than I am. So I think that's good. Um, we've talked about why is this important and what does it look like and uh, how, you know, how this journey appears on the outside. And then the uh, second to last question that we want to ask you is, um, and some of this is in the chat, what stops this? What are the barriers? What are the challenges? What are the difficulties? Like what's, what's so hard about it? <laughs> so I definitely have some strong, strong thoughts in this area. Um, we, we interview a lot of data engineers and you can definitely hear their frustration in terms of you know, the pace that they're converting, um, stuff like that. I kind of think of it in three categories. The first one is that's really frustrating for a lot of companies is that data changes. Uh, We talk a lot about this term data drift, which is really the changing of data that manifests itself in in three distinct ways. The structure of data, the semantic nature of data, so the meaning of data, and then the downstream and upstream infrastructure has changes that kind of mess with the data. So just operating data seems on paper to be a, a really straightforward proposition. But once data starts to flow through various data platforms, data wrangling services, data integration steps, it gets a little unwieldy. So as they start to scale, that can kind of become pretty hairy. Um, the second one I talk about, and I think has is, is been a big pitfall when we talk to, uh, to corporations, is what we call the bow tie effect. So most, uh, most companies, they are scaling the amount of sources that the, the company is ingesting. They're not just doing point of sale stuff. Now they're bringing in clickstream data. They're bringing in social data. Um, I think Gartner has some great uh, figures about how much external data companies are now kind of bringing in. So that, those requests for getting the data in are, are scaling. Um, at the same time, a lot of businesses are scaling the data science team. Um, so the amount of analysts, the different kind of analysts, whether they're quants or whether they're, uh, you know, more coding Python data scientists, they're building these teams. And I think that they're thinking about it pretty logistically. But what often we don't see to parity that is scaling of the data engineering team. So what you have is all of these sources that the business wants, an extremely kind of, uh, you know, constrained team. 
in order to deliver that, and then the data science team, which is really why it's critical that data science and data engineering, if, if you want to move to AI and do more oper oper uh, operationalizing of models um, and, and data science, it's really key that those teams are just attached at the head and talking to each other. But they don't want to be, do they? Um, I mean, they can have differing opinions. They're obviously looking at it from a differing lens, but I talk to a lot of data engineers that, uh, you know, they find the data science aspect of it cool. And so they, they're actually leaning into a lot of those conversations. I think mm. they'd rather engineer a pipeline or engineer uh, a data task that gets the right data to the data scientist versus kind of iterating over and over again. So I think mm -hmm. they, you know, I think there's a genuine altruistic, um, you know, desire to, to kind of understand those responses. It's a good point um, on the data engineering side. It's something that I struggled with too, is explaining, you know, if, if you look at an iceberg, right? I, I'll use the iceberg example. All of the stuff that goes on behind, below the water, below the line that people see, everything that it takes to, to move this data operationally and all that kind of stuff. You know, I harp on my data engineering team all the time why is moving data from point A to point B so difficult in this day and age? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But being able to explain that out is tricky. So, you know, you need headcount, you need all this resourcing to, in order to manage that. You might need offshore resources for the operational side. Um, it, it's actually an interesting point because it is a big barrier, but I don't, I don't know yet. And then this is why I'm asking the, the rest of the, the colleagues and the panelists here, you know, how do you, paint that picture properly. You know, I used the, I used the iceberg example before. I've used a lot of kind of, uh, you know, initial requests. If I get headcount, I basically put them directly to data engineering pretty much. Um, yeah. yeah, Edwin, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that anybody's, uh, I don't know that anybody's cracked it uh, all the way yet, right? I mean, the, the challenge for us has always been that the, the, the desire is to do the really uh, to do the really high speed stuff, right? To to do the the data science projects and to do you know solve solve the big problems and and create the best models. Uh, but when you when you turn around and you, and you talk about the rest of the iceberg, right? And you tell the leaders, uh, you know, your your million dollar idea is nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars to data engineering and fifty thousand dollars to data science. They don't they don't love that answer, right? Because it's so much of what has to happen is to your point is data movement, you know, moving clean data, preparing clean data, uh, getting data in the right stages at the right times for the right models, especially live data, operational data. Um, that's, I mean, we, we find, I, I ran a business intelligence team before, uh, before the team that I'm, I'm running today. And half the time that we spent with leaders was explaining uh, the pipe of data going to their email, right? You know, to, to, get, a, to get a daily report into a leader's inbox, is uh you know is really a, a 48 hour evolution where it comes from banking systems and it comes through APIs and then it shows up in our data and it moves down and we had to walk them through that whole thing and explain well this is this is why you can't get you know your nice clean full reports with all of your dimensions and all of your cuts and everything right away right I can mm -hmm. give you some things live but it's certainly not nearly as rich um, so yeah I mean I, I think the the discussion always goes back to you know how can we you know, how can we, how can we build the project such that we've got enough, uh, we've got enough engineering in the, in the tail end, right. That nobody really wants to talk about, but it's, it's the line items are at least there. Yeah. These are some real good challenges. Not that we have the answers, but we're highlighting what the challenges are. Yeah. Uh, any other final challenges before we move to our last question? Hey, if I may, I wanted to listen to uh, the panelists uh, because my, this, I have this uh, hypothesis that there's two kind of companies, and it seems to me, uh, well, let's let me say there's a Silicon Valley type of company, and then there's the Main Street kind of company. And what I'm hearing so far is seems to me a bit more the perspective of the Silicon Valley kind of company, companies that are mature in terms of technology to some extent. Yeah, mm, and and, sure. I, and I say that because I work with some companies who are starting to implement their analytics. So they are not even yet worrying about the volume of data. They are worrying about how to use data. Uh, and what can, asking the question, what can we do with data? How much should we invest? Even uh, from, from uh, what I hear from, from Sean, Christopher, and Edwin is uh, problems which are somewhat more advanced. And I don't know the audience uh, where, where they come from and, and what the, the situation is, but uh, just trying to put that into context a little bit. Uh, and also, uh, 
Christopher mentioned uh, something uh, very interesting, uh, which is something I, I have seen uh, more generally, the communication problems, right? How to sell the, uh, the ideas, the, the projects to, to uh, top leadership. And it's not only to top leadership, it's uh, when you want to um, adopt new technology, you have to really sell it across the entire organization. And this is especially a problem for the main street kind of company uh, mm -hmm. in which which are not used to, to the technology and don't trust it and, and have a hard time communicating with the technical people. The technical people will understand the benefits, the problems, uh, but uh, it's kind of some kind of cultural barrier, uh, yes. which I, I, I have seen. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, to me, that's kind of the most un uh, biggest underlying problem, basically the difficulties in communicating the different parts of the organization. That's fantastic. And this reminds me of what Scott Reedy was talking about earlier during the opening remarks with um, curiosity and trust, or sorry, creativity and trust. And the creativity and trust are very cold. Those kind of barriers um, can stop advancements in their tracks. So I have one more uh, thing to add, and this is actually somewhat new for me-ish, but it's always kind of been around in the background is data governance. Mm. Uh, I know that's a lot of, that's a really loaded word and there's a million things that go on behind it, but is it, it is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, um, especially as say like, you know, the whole Microsoft 365 suite. Now we have Power BI popping up all over the place. Anyone with an Excel file can basically put a, a dashboard together and start showing their numbers. Um, yep. You know, where did that come from? You know, there, I, I can't tell you how much time we waste kind of reconciling numbers, explaining ourselves. And I think Chris, you, you mentioned it too, kind of you go through the entire journey of what does it take to get you an email in your inbox? Like, it's crazy. So like yeah. being able to kind of have a framework of which the company agrees to and moves towards a, a data governance structure is becoming very important. Yeah. Um, and it's a big hurdle for us to get there. We don't have anything quite ready yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the last question, you know, we've talked about like, why is this important? What does it look like? Um, what are the barriers, challenges, difficulties? And the last question I actually had for you, I'm going to throw out because Ayush had a great, ask a great question in the chat. So I'm going to use his question, which is um, what can I do? <laughs> what can I do? And so this is sort of a, you know, if you were to give someone a final piece of advice of one thing, that they can do to help with the BI to AI to CI kind of journey, recognizing that, you know, it needs to happen with complex questions this way and, you know, all the benefits and all the challenges and all that kind of stuff. What would you say to someone who wants to help, who wants to get their company moving in the right direction? I think for me, it's, we, we, you know, we tell this advice to, to new folks, right. That, that join, you know, interns or, or, you know, younger folks and even, you know, new managers, right. New directors that join it's it, for us, it's about hitting base hits, right. You, you show up and you hit base hits. Um, it's not, you're not going to show up and you're not going to hit home runs. You're not going to deliver a new model or a new artificial intelligence product or a new, like right away. But the cumulative process of showing up every day and hitting base hits and, you know, using, using the right, you know, using tools that you're comfortable with, that you know how to use, um, you know, conditioning data and, and working on data and improving data every single day. Um, those, the cumulative effect of those is really powerful. So if you show up and you hit base hits uh, every single day, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to turn around after 12, you know, 12, 18, 24 months, and you're going to be a lot further down the road than, uh, than you ever expected. Um, mm -hmm. If you just work at it, you know, bit, bit by bit, piece by piece. Uh, just show yep. up and get better and better every day. I love it. I love it. I, I started playing pickleball recently. And um, I guess in some ways it, it might be like anger management. I don't know. Cause I, I just, there's a soft game and then there's a hard game and I only know the hard game. Whereas if I just sort of, you know, it's called dinking. If I just sort of dink it over and over and dink and dink and dink, the other person will eventually mess up, you know? Right. And right. so it's that incremental, like if you just chip at it, you just have to have patience to chip the things and don't try to boil the ocean. I love it. That's yeah. great advice. What other advice would you give someone who's either entry level or seasoned and they're just like, gosh, help me do something, you know, and I know this will come up in the discussion, like the conversations, um, which will happen in, in just a minute or two, but what, what other advice would you have? So it might sound a little overly simplistic, but um, 
just listen and learn. Um, if you're trying to do things the same way that you did 20 years ago, you're trying to, you know, develop in waterfall, um, you know, keep things locked up in a data warehouse, you're not, you're not going to get to the end result. So, you know, so much of this evolution is really about people and process, you know, reorienting mm -hmm. of teams, changing the way that developers do things to more kind of a continuous delivery type of cycle. Um, and that's, you know, some people are not going to be okay with that. And it's okay if they, you know, you know, either exit the team or, or the team looks different than when you started. Um, hmm. and you do have to you do have to break some glass in the process, right? So mm. being able to listen and, and, and be on that journey with the company um, is really key. Um, and you're, you'll learn a lot in the process and, and that'll, that'll amplify your brand as a, as, a, as a practitioner. Love it. All in something from Equifax. He's on Tag Data Talk and he, he mentioned uh, something related to what you just said, Sean, and he called it empathy. Like if you have empathy for, the decision maker, the business person that's, that's, you know, really asking the questions, then you tend to go farther with this advancement. Empathy's a good other, Yeah, I love it. That uh, Listen to Tag Data Talk. There's a whole podcast interview on it. It's great with Colin. Any other thoughts on um, final piece of advice? It's I was going to say something similar to Sean, but because he, he took that uh, from me, I will, I will move on <laughs> to kind of another thought that I had, which is, and this, this is a little bit provocative, I guess, but I, I would say, you know, if you find yourself in a job of where you are somewhere in that chain of, of BI to AI to CI, take a look around and see what that team makeup looks like um, from my side. Like, I, I think that we talked a little bit about that here. Um, there, there are a lot of functions that go into making a successful AI, CI transformation or our product. I mean, you have people who need to understand the business problem. You have project managers trying to understand like how to hit timelines and, and hit things. You have data engineers, you have data scientists, you have BI developers. You know, is your makeup correct? And if it's not, then there might be something that you're going to hit kind of in, in the in the downstream processes that you probably want to keep in mind. Um, it's not really, I don't want to say that it's a warning, but it's something that I've noticed is that mm -hmm. these analytic teams need a ton of jobs and roles. And I mm -hmm. think in order to be successful, especially with high volume, you need the people in the places, you need the positions, you need, you have to have the right makeup in order to do what you need to do. So mm -hmm. just, just a, again, like I, I don't want to sound morbid or kind of <laughs> too, 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 you know, negative here, but I, I think it's something to at least take a look at it and make sure that you understand your place in that area. Yeah, no, it's good to know these things in advance. I have to mention one thing that I see, uh, I see a kind of uh, a mistake that my students uh, do over and over every year I teach this class. And, and it's, I think, just a common and natural behavior uh, we all tend to, to follow. Uh, so basically my advice is to, adv is to avoid this behavior is always make sure that you have very clear goals or what you want to achieve. So and, and, uh, and because I'm trying to give some advice, which is broad enough for everybody too. So always set the goals very clearly for the project. It, no matter if you are a contributor, contributor or manager or uh, whatever your position is, try to make sure the, the, the goals are very clear, define good metrics to know, uh, to make sure that yeah, you are really achieving those goals. Uh, and, and again, this doesn't need to apply only to managers or, or top uh, leadership. It, it, everybody can contribute to this. Make sure, ask questions, talk to, to, you, to, to, your, um, to your boss. Uh, make sure that everything is, is, is heading in the right direction. And this is connected to what Edwin was saying too. Make sure that, that everything is in place. Yes. Yeah, and the fact that anybody can do it, anybody can help um, and contribute in that effort, that's awesome. Very good. We had six rooms. There is a uh, team Kim Lee <laughs> uh, that ran one. And then there's um, Alex that ran two. Three was Michael Hines. Uh, four was Chris. Five was Mary from Salonis. And six was Ryan from Access Group. So we had six great rooms. I peeked in the, um, each room at least twice. And uh, um, you guys were just really into it. So thank you for that. So Kim Lee, can you give us your real quick synopsis of what did you guys say? 
Yeah, so we talked about how, you know, um, BI to AI to CI may not be kind of a, a transition necessarily. It could coexist as, um, you know, BI sort of evolving to AI. Um, and then we also talked about kind of our um, difficulty in making kind of like leadership understand what we need, um, you know, understand the tools that we're currently having. Um, gosh, there was a lot of good points. Um, Okay, I love it. I know I I called you off guard here. <clears throat> I put some of your comments in the uh, chat. Feel free to add more. And then Alex, can you tell us more about how Group 2 did? Yeah, so we had uh, people with a number of different backgrounds. So we touched on two of the questions, the thirst from BI to AI. It went around the room because people had different uh, industry or different experiences. We touched on everything from how it can... Uh, AI is augmenting radiologists, and I was surprised to hear there's not as much of a, uh, of a fear that's going to take over their job, but looking at it as something that will augment their capabilities. Uh, we talked about uh, with Peter about uh, using predictive analytics to improve forecasting. Mary from StreamSets was talking about use cases that some of the ones that surprised her in mining and agriculture and how to use AI to grow better avocados. So <clears throat> there's a thirst, you know, across the board that we Came to, and then the other topic was uh, that we touched on with tips for evolving and some ways to involve, uh, evolve include uh, enterprise data literacy programs, data thinking workshops. We talked about uh -huh. prioritization and understanding the ROI as a way to get the funding that Kim, Kim was talking about and um, not to under, uh, underestimate the complexity of manual processes and to form collegial relationships with uh, stakeholders. Mm, love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. The uh, third group was run by Michael, I think. Heinz. Hey, Beverly. Um, yeah, really good, interesting discussion. I, I think everybody participated and gave really good feedback from a variety of different uh, backgrounds. But one of the things that was brought up is it, it's really a journey, at least in my interpretation of everything. It's really a journey. It's about the value uh, that you're trying to to drive out of it. Is it a one-time value? Is it a long-term value? Um, and when you're thinking about the journey from AI, from BI to AI to CI, it really, it's about the change management aspect and the, mm -hmm. the human element and, and how that comes into play. And, and I really do think that that's powerful because, um, you know, I, I know I see that every day. That is the biggest aspect of, of moving people off of the status quo. So I thought that was a really good insight. Um, you know, when we look at CI, I think that collectively it's, it's really all about the future. It's where we're going and, you know, how do we get there is the question. And, and I think the panel did a good job earlier today just talking about, you know, getting the, the, the right folks involved is a continuous process. You have to re, keep reinventing the use case, reinventing, re talking about the value to people um, because otherwise, typically, you know, they, they'll uh, continue doing the same. So I, yeah. I think if, if you want to be competitive in today's day and age, I do think the needle has to move. And uh, based on the discussion that we had today, I, I think um, that was pretty much a, a team consensus is that um, we, it's just all about the value that we're driving. And mm -hmm. so, love it. Love it. Very good. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris from Team 4, what'd you guys say? Yeah, we had a good we had a good conversation. Um, it was a it was a good group, and that we you know we had a little bit of representation from academia, uh, but also some folks right uh, that that have been doing this uh, from the business intelligence side of things as well. So, uh, you know, on the on the first question, right, the kind of the 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 desire to move along the maturity curve, um, you know, we it, it it's a bit of a mixed group, right? Some some folks have said like they see their organization kind of heading that way, and and, and going down that road, but we also, um, you know, we also heard from some folks that, that, uh, there's some skepticism, right. That, mm -hmm. that kind of moving beyond the kind of blocking and tackling of, uh, of doing the business intelligence work, uh, is going to provide, is going to provide a lot of value. So it, you know, and I think, I think for some companies, uh, there is a lot of hesitation. There is a lot of, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of skepticism that, uh, that, you know, analytic tools are going to turn out the things that everybody, uh, that everybody thinks that they will for the amount of effort that it takes to launch some of those things. And I, you know, I, you know, from my own personal experience working in the federal government, like I, I, I can tell you firsthand that there are a lot of skeptics, uh, 
uh, throughout the federal government that uh, that analytic tools are going to be the panacea that everybody paints them to be. So, um, mm. you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of work there to overcome, you know, some of that uh, institutional bias against moving further down the curve. Love it. Love it. Very good. Thank you so much. Sounds like y'all had some great conversations. Yeah. And then uh, I'm going to move to room six, which was Ryan. Can you give us a quick summary, Ryan, of um, what your team uh, came up with? Yeah, definitely. So we had a great group, uh, different representations as well from the BI and also auto ML and academia. So uh, it was a good conversation. The one topic that we touched on was executive level and C-suite prioritization of moving from BI to AI. So we thought it was an interesting concept that uh, when you mentioned that some teams are fighting over those uh, wow. AI projects to get done and building the bit, like the best use case. So it was interesting to hear from how Caroline's leaders at Under Armour, how uh, they wanted to use AI, but still it's important to just make sure that you're able to pull up the, you can find the number of shorts sold in Florida. And that's a prioritization that needs to be settled first. And then uh, we had Ted from Dot Data sharing how uh, some leaders can get lost in the AI concepts when they're trying to invest in it as well. So making sure that those are cleared up for them before uh, prioritizing. Very nice. Thank you so much. Um, getting some patterns. <laughs> As someone who's been paid for pattern recognition for the past 30 years, I'm starting to see some patterns. And I'll give you a few little nuggets at the end. The last team uh, was team five, which Mary, did you run that team? Tell us what you guys discussed. That'd be awesome. Yeah, um, it was it was a great uh, discussion. And I think, you know, we, we started off with kind of why is it important? And I think, uh, you know, we kind of all landed on the fact that it's really where the, you know, rubber meets the road and, you know, and, and really it's not just about having the data, but being able to action it, um, you know, and talking about describing the journey, you know, uh, you know, people were talking about, you know, just having, you know, some consistency um, and, you know, we used to, it, I think the quote was, it's, a, it's an advancement in art um, and then just some difficulties. We talked a lot about some barriers and difficulties. And I think that the biggest, you know, biggest ones were around, you know, alignment and, you know, with, you know, business goals um, and, you know, business, you know, business unit alignment, um, you know, levels of communication, and then just, you know, you know, increased peer engagement across, you know, across all, you know, the organization. Very nice. Thank you for that. So in summary, if I were to sort of, you know, word cloud this, um, using my lack of AI available at the very moment, but just brain. Um, <laughs> what I heard consistently was not necessarily in order, but the use cases slash value, that seems to be king, like illustrating, demonstrating, uh, being able to say there is value um, is important. A second big nugget that I saw was um, this idea of trust. And it was interesting because I got to be honest, when Scott first mentioned trust, I was kind of like, hmm, because, you know, the opening remarks, he talked about creativity and trust. And I thought, what does he mean by that? But you guys see it, too. And so the idea of trust of your everything, trust of your data, trust of your tools, of your solutions, of your even of your, your data science period, or even to go so far as trust of the discipline of analytics. I mean, some people, believe it or not, don't actually believe in analytics or data science. So just having that trust, I think I heard consistently in this, uh, talking about this journey, I heard that term consistently. A third thing that I heard over and over again is um, culture. And it was culture in relation to senior leaders. It was culture in relation to empathy and understanding. It was cultural in many different facets. So I heard culture um, many times. That's probably the most common term that I heard, I would, I would think. Uh, obviously, I should have counted the number of times I heard the word data, but <laughs> the culture was a big one. And then the last nugget, which I think is one that we can, a good one for us to walk away with is, it's about inches, not miles. And inching toward um, that movement is going to be more effective and probably more long term, you know, it'll stick, it'll, it'll have that feature to it. Um, then trying to go, you know, from uh, birth to running, like you're not going to become a marathon runner overnight, probably. So crawling, um, you know, just squirming around on your tummy right now, some some companies are but crawling and, uh, and standing and walking and running, instead of just um, 
running right away. And uh, very good. So uh, the last thing we have for you guys is that we want you to come to our next one. <laughs> and so you see how this is different. You like really get to know people. You really get to absorb the content. So I hope it's been useful from that. So huge thanks to University of South Carolina, Center for Applied Business Analytics. Shout out to Sunny Park from U of SC, Raphael for serving from U of SC, and Caroline from being here, uh, for also from U of SC. I think I got all, all my U of SC colleagues. Huge shout out, of course, to Access Group for also co-hosting this event. Uh, thank you again to our panelists and a uh, huge thanks to our discussion leads. You guys, you, you, these um, are most meaningful, I think, because of the conversations, the depth of the conversations and, and the colors that come out of some of, um, of what people say in these small groups and these sessions. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your participation and for helping to um, drive this event forward.